It's another Q&A edition of Optimal Health Daily, episode 115. Get ready to maximize your potential with Optimal Health Daily, the podcast that brings you the best content in health, fitness, and nutrition five days a week. Your optimal life awaits. Now here's your host, Dr. Neil Malik. Hey, and welcome to another Friday edition of Optimal Health Daily, where I answer your health questions related to fitness, diet, nutrition, stress management, anything along those lines. Why am I qualified to answer your questions? Well, let me tell you. I have both my master's and doctorate degrees in public health. I'm also a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified exercise physiologist or personal trainer, same thing, certified health education specialist, Oh, let's see, what else? I'm also an assistant professor at Bastyr University, California, and a professor at two other campuses. Now, if you want to send in a question, basically, it's like getting a consultation for free. It's really easy to do. Just come by oldpodcast.com and look for the bar along the side of the page that says, ask a health question. If you click on that, you can record a message straight from your computer's microphone or from a phone if you use the app. You can do multiple takes, and once you're happy with it, you can then submit it to us. It's that easy. Or if you want to do things the old-fashioned way, you can call 61 I Love ohd So either that or visit oldpodcast.com, send in your question, and you'll be in small, special raffles to win books from us. We are rapidly closing in on the Christmas holiday. I did get some more shopping done yesterday, but I still have more to do. So I'm going to knock this Q&A episode out and then head back out into the craziness and continue my shopping. So with that, let's hear the question for today as we optimize your life. Hi, Dr. Neal. Recently, I've seen recipes call for kosher salt or pink Himalayan salt. Um, Personally, I always just buy regular iodized table salt. And I'm wondering what the differences are between the various salts that are out there. And are there any benefits of choosing one over the other? Thanks. Thank you for your question, Nikki. I should start by mentioning that all salt is technically sea salt. This is because even when we mine from underground salt mines, at one point, those were all underwater. Now, salt is basically made up of two components, sodium and chloride which is why you'll hear some nerds like me sometimes refer to salt as sodium chloride. Basically, each form of salt contains some sodium and some chloride, but the way they may differ are in the ways they are processed. These different processing methods may often lead to differences in taste and texture as well. Now, when we think about the potential health effects of salt, we're often referring to the sodium itself. Too much sodium consumed for years and years can lead to an increased risk of high blood pressure, So let's keep this in mind as I discuss some of the different forms of salt. Let me start with sea salt. Sea salt is made by simply evaporating seawater or other forms of salty water. Usually there's some processing involved here as well, but it's often minimal. Now, depending on where the original water source came from, the salt may have other minerals attached to it. These minerals may add some color and may cause the salt to have a different texture as well. Now to get from sea salt to table salt, you have some more processing involved. Part of this is the removal of some of these trace minerals that are typically found in sea salt, you know, the ones that are kind of hanging on and attached, like I mentioned before. Removing the trace minerals removes some of the color as well. This is why table salt is consistently bright white. Some companies may also incorporate an additive during the processing to prevent any clumping. Most, though, add iodine. Now, iodine is an essential nutrient, which means we must get it from our diets. Our bodies cannot make iodine on their own. If we don't get enough iodine in our diets, we actually are at risk for serious consequences, like stunted growth in children to thyroid issues in adults. As a result, many countries now iodize their salt to prevent iodine deficiencies. This is actually why many consider table salt to be superior to other salts. Sea salt actually doesn't contain much iodine, if any at all. So you may wonder, well, don't we get iodine in our diets and other ways besides salt? Yes, seafood, including seaweed, yogurt, milk, and even some grains contain iodine. Now, even though these foods are commonly consumed, there are still risks for deficiency, even for those living in the US. This can be partly explained by the fact that some foods can actually interfere with our body's ability to metabolize iodine. Many are surprised to find that these foods are actually nutritious foods. 
like cabbage, Brussels sprouts, soy, and cauliflower. So these foods tend to block the metabolism of iodine. We also know that most of the soil in the U.S. is low in iodine. It didn't used to be. And the salt used in processed foods, basically foods you'd find in a box at the grocery store, are often stripped of iodine. So we may not be getting as much iodine in our diets as we believe. I also want to mention that having trace minerals in your salts may not always be a good thing. It sounds like a good thing on the surface, but if we really think about it, what if one of those trace minerals is lead? Lead is a toxin for the body. Or what about arsenic, a known poison? Or in the case of Himalayan salt, plutonium. Yes, there's actually plutonium in Himalayan salt. So in some cases, removing these impurities can be beneficial. Now let's go back to this idea of sodium again. With regards to actual sodium content between these farms, because again, sodium is the thing we really look at when we think about increased risk for high blood pressure. It turns out that no matter which type of salt we're discussing, they're basically the same. Some forms like kosher salt and sea salt may have a little bit less actual sodium, but not enough to lead to significant health effects, either positive or negative. Ditto for Himalayan salt. However, if a recipe does call for kosher salt, for example, you'll want to use that. This is because if you substitute, let's say, table salt instead, you'll end up with a saltier tasting dish. This is because kosher salt crystals tend to be much larger, so when you end up using table salt instead, you'll end up with a lot more than you need. Regardless of the type of salt you prefer to use, current recommendations by most health agencies state that adults should get no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Let's put this in real terms. This is a little less than a teaspoon. Yes, even with the pushback from those studies about salt not being associated with increased disease risk, we are still finding that many of those studies were quite flawed. So it couldn't hurt to just continue to be on the safe side and keep your salt, or really your sodium intake, to a moderate level. I'll actually end this with a quote from one of the smartest individuals in the world, Marilyn Voss Savant. In case you weren't aware, she's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for having one of the highest IQs known to humans. My wife thinks I'm actually in love with her, but I swear I just respect her for her intelligence. Anywho, she weighed in on this very topic when a reader of her column asked, which is healthier, sea salt or table salt? She mentioned that iodine is added to table salt, Sound familiar? And because of its impact on reducing iodine deficiencies worldwide, and I quote, table salt is healthier, end quote. Thank you again for your question, Nikki. You're gonna be entered into a very small raffle every month to win a book from us. And one last time, really quickly, you can be entered into small raffles and possibly have your question answered right here on the show. Just come by oldpodcast.com to submit your question or call 61 I love OHD. It's that easy. If you can believe it, that's 115 episodes of Optimal Health Daily in the books. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. This is one of my favorite parts of this show, so keep sending them in. Thank you for sharing the show with a friend. And for those of you that celebrate, have a very Merry Christmas, or for those of you in the UK and Australia, a very Happy Christmas. To those of other faiths, I wish you a very happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, happy Festivus. I think I covered it all. Anyways, have a wonderful holiday, and I'll see you on next week's show, where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this show, and Optimal Living Daily, the brother podcast of this one. Literally, I'm Dr. Neil's brother. If you like the format of this show, you'll love Optimal Living Daily, too, where I also read to you from blogs, but cover other topics like personal development, finance, and minimalism from bloggers like Derek Sivers, The Minimalists, Zen Habits, and many more. So for more amazing content read to you for free, come subscribe to Optimal Living Daily too, and together we'll optimize your life. You've been listening to Optimal Health Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift, as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us, and remember, your optimal life awaits.